All right, well then we'll start. All right, I'm excited. Our guest today is author Stephanie Kuntz, author of this book and this book. Well, more book, more books than these, but these are the one, these are the ones that I happen to have on my bookshelf. So I'm I'm really excited. Um, I have to say, of all the people we're talking to, I think you're you're the you're the only one that I have that I have two books that uh, that that, in, that impacted me, and more more so than anyone else. Um, your your books and your ideas have have shaped a my previous book, not just father figure, but also the, but also the new childhood. So, so I want to talk to you about, about both of these books. I want to tell you uh, that w why they, why they moved me and to, and to hear from, from you and, and discuss some of these ideas with you. So, so I guess I'll just get started unless there's something you want to say first. Oh, it sounds great. It's uh, I, I looked uh, through you, you know, you've got a fascinating uh, group of uh, issues that you address. And so I'm interested uh, to hear from you too. <laughs> All right. Great. Great. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with talking about the, the way thing the way things never never were because this this book um, um, uh, all, already when I was writing the new childhood the the way that you talk about this idea of um, of family as being this nostalgic this nostalgic ideal that, that as the as the title is it ne that was never really there but it's always sort of been this fantasy presenting. Um, aspirations, limitations, ideas about the conventions that that we're all supposed to uh, uh, at least try to try to live up to, and, and, and that was huge for me because, um, especially when I was writing the new childhood and thinking about how digital uh, how digital devices and and screen based uh, life was changing childhood, it was so clear to me that so many of the arguments against screen-based life were based on a, uh, on this ideal notion of what a perfect childhood experience was which, which 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 at least at least according to everything I've read from you is not something that really ever existed is, is that fair to say <laughs> yeah I mean I, I as I've gotten older and especially over the last four years um, I've understood nostalgia a little better, I think, than when I first started researching it. I think that usually it's not so much what people really remember as what as a critique of what's going on right now and a cry of pain. Uh, and I've come to think that there's healthy nostalgia, the kind that we feel for the good times we had with friends and want to recover. And then there's the unhealthy nostalgia that uh, pretends that we could go back to some time that was better. And, and that's the point you're getting at, that there's really never been any uh, time when everybody was doing better. There might have been time when some people were doing better or some families were doing better, but there's no magic solution in the past. Um, so, so, so for me, it's really important to help people understand that there have been a lot of different ways to do family and to do parenting. Uh, there have been lots of ways to fail at it, and we <laughs> certainly fail at it in um, in our society many times socially, uh, and other society, but other societies have failed at it too. Uh, so we have to pick and choose. You know, it's a mix and match situation. What what worked in one era might not work now. Uh, what looks like it works in one era may have worked at the expense of a whole bunch of other people. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, one 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 concept that 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 was is really fascinating, which which you really do a lot in 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 the way in the way we never were, is this idea of 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 the split between home and work, right? That industrial age uh, split between between this idea that these things that these things are separate spheres, which of course we're all taught that this is. Uh, 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 an ancient thing, right? That the men went off to do the hunt and the women stayed home and tended the kitchens, even though we didn't even have kitchens in the in the ancient in the ancient world. Um, um, but 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 even before just thinking about it as a as a gendered idea, which I definitely want to talk a, a lot about, and uh, we'll move on to that in a second. Just the idea of this notion of of work as being this industrial rough. Um, um, you know, I think of it as like plate glass and machinery, uh, um, um, and 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 the, and and the, uh, uh, and that being um, contrasted with the idea of the home as this comfortable nest, um, and and that just our resistance to any idea of splitting these two ideas, th these two things, you know, of, of getting rid of the narrative split there. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I'm just writing a chapter on my new book that I've been really uh, struggling with because I raised all sorts of uh, issues that will probably be controversial, uh, including arguing that patriarchy is not the main, the, there's no such thing as the patriarchy. <laughs> That's not the, I, I, and I saw a comment like that in the very beginning of your book and went, yes, I agree with that. Um, but but let's just go stay with the, the work family thing for a bit, because one of the things that I'm really getting into right now in the medieval world, and it was a patriarchal world, uh, women, Wives were supposed to be subordinate to their husbands, um, but everybody was subordinate to somebody in those days. The wife was subordinate to the husband as a subject was subordinate to his social superior, female or male. Something that most people don't know and that I didn't know until fairly recently is the word Mrs. The, the title Mrs. didn't used to describe whether you were married or not, just like Mr. never has described it. Mrs. meant it was the exact equivalent of master. It meant someone who uh, governed other people and had authority. Uh, it was a, a master and a mistress were people of social rank. And not everybody was entitled to the prefix mis Mr. or Mrs. And in the 17th and 18th century, it was applied to unmarried women as well. So, so when we look back at this idea that it is men who do the work and that women's and that wives um, do love, <laughs> it's often not even called work in the home, um, you, you really are negating most of history. If you go back to this, say, the 16th and 17th century, which I happen to be reviewing right now, um, you, you, you've got these households that are the center of production. And uh, the, if you're a property household, then a, a wife, as soon as she became a wife and mother, hired, hired a servant or brought in uh, other people to do the child care because, in fact, she expanded her involvement in remunerative labor, uh, labor because she could spend more time um, uh, producing things. You know, she didn't wait for the man. I'm sorry, to can you define baby. remunerative labor? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, that maybe earned cash. Most things were not cash. Um, and so they would be trade, there would be credit, there would be networks. And the result was that if you've ever walked into the a home of a, of a farmer, uh, I grew up uh, <laughs> with one, um, it, it's not a, a place of retreat. It's a total mess, you know, and there's work going on there all the time. And the other side of it is that the work that goes on there has to be combined with you know, the routines that we now think of as separate from work, but life, <laughs> life as opposed to work. Um, and although women were subordinate in that, there was no sense that they could not be, act exactly as a man did. In fact, they were deputy husbands for their, uh, for the men. So there was no sense that men did one thing called work and that women took care of life or emotional arrangements. I think that's important too when we think about men and the points you make about how men are supposed to be impersonal. Women often had to be much more impersonal than we are today because they were the ones who kept track of who owes what to whom. <laughs> and do we, do we actually trust? I know the gossip, by the way, gossip used to stand for godparent of either sex because you had to know what people were doing and you had to have these obligations. So. Women had to be very impersonal and shrewd at times, and men had to stay on top of these social networks and uh, make sure that they kept going. They had to, you know, say, okay, well, what is going on in this family that I have to do? And I have to, you know, acknowledge that they had a kid and uh, I, maybe I'll help her make her uh, arrange a wedding for these people because that's all part of the work family inextricable combination. So it's only later that you get this idea that work is something that moves out of the home. And it's not till the 19th century and not till 1821 that we get the first use of the word male breadwinner. Um, before that, I found these letters. The only time that you can find a, a man describing himself as his family's sole provider, he's not bragging, he's complaining. <laughs> he said, you know, he's saying, oh, my God, my wife won't do it or she can't do it. So uh, make give me some pity. But, you know, give me a break. <laughs> so as, as you say, all those things are just so completely new. And yet for 200 years, we have been so involved in them that we've all internalized, uh, not just men, but women have internalized this idea that we are the experts in the familial interpersonal sphere. And sometimes we 
ask for help uh, from the men. And men are the experts in the impersonal work field. And sometimes they have, you know, unskilled help, uh, like secretaries or something. But it's a different world. And this is just something that was unknown in the past. Not that not that women were better off in the past, <laughs> but that they one, what is really striking me as I'm doing this new research is that they did not internalize the idea that they had to, that they were different from men in that way. They were, you had to obey, but you didn't think you could, you could resist it. You could go around. You didn't feel guilty uh, if you didn't. It was only if you didn't get away with it that you, you know, you were in trouble. <laughs> so and, I have an, an abstract question on this. Is it, is it simply human, the human mechanism that we create these dramatically different explanations for our history based on where we are around nostalgia than what actually occurred? Because the, what you're describing and the way we perceive, you know, our history and, and our gender essentialist way of setting up relationships and marriages and child rearing, they just seem so remarkably different. Is that just how humans have always operated? Well, of course, you know, humans are storytellers and, and we tell stories right from the beginning. We've told stories to reinforce certain kinds of behaviors. You know, if you go back to early foraging societies, you know, the kind of stories they tell uh, have to do with, you know, your need for others. If you look at their stories about uh, about the supernatural world, it's all about it's not about any punishing gods or anything. It's about these uh, animals that you have to call on for help because they're all interconnected. And so we make up stories uh, that help us cope with what we've got. And some of the stories, um, you know, are like, you know, some of them really do help people cope. <laughs> uh, the other thing that really strikes me, and again, I hate to, I've just immersed in this particular chapter, so I, I don't want to <laughs> railroad us into that particular thing. But the other thing that strikes me is that one of our, really interesting human qualities is that we do have this sense of obligation to others. Um, but we also, unlike animals, can violate it when it's in our interest. And so we have to make up stories to, to justify that as well. And I think a lot of the stories that we made up about how families were, were to explain this division between men and women. Well, if all, especially as we've got these democratic, these progressive democratic ideas that people should be equal, well, then you can no longer say the wife should be subordinate, the sub husband as the subject is subordinate to the crown, but you have to explain why you're doing different things. And it made sense to do different things. The male breadwinner family was very efficient at one point in history because it allowed men to go out and work for wages and women to actually focus, if they could, on improving the sanitation and the comfort of the house. It was a very fleeting stage that it was very efficient, but we had to make up stories about why it was not only efficient, it was just and it was natural. And those stories yes. are still- And yet in the, the feminine mystique, you know, what is it they call the, the, the syndrome of women um, in Betty Friedan's book, you know, it, it pod, did it work better for men than for women? Because it seems like there was a lot of- um, women being homemakers that caused enormous amount of anxiety and boredom and frustration and feeling trapped, et cetera. I might just be projecting. I don't know. <laughs> well, yes, it's, it's pretty clear that there were, there was a lot of unhappiness there. On the other hand, I I don't like to like compare pains. They're different pains. Sure. Um, and I think there's a lot of pain involved in, but we recognize it more for male breadwinners. Oh, that they're making a sacrifice to go out. Right. and earn the money and work longer hours than they want and be bossed by bosses they don't particularly respect. But then women, we were told, they're not making a sacrifice when they stay home. They're doing this out of love. And I think that was one of the real disabling things about the new, more democratic and more benign kind of treatment of women compared to the older patriarchal one, is that we stopped seeing it as something we had to do that we were forced to do and that we, we might quit, we could grumble about <laughs> and evade if we wanted to. And we started defining it as our nature and our love and feeling guilty if we didn't always feel that way. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, at, 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 at what's really at, at least of, of deep concern to me is 
is the degree to which that narrative, that naturalized narrative of, of gendered roles and, and that split became so commonplace that now we're, now we're so resistant to losing that story, right? That, that it, would it, would lose, it would lose our foothold uh, on, on how to make sense of our reality. You know, a, a lot of what I write about in Father Figure is just how hard it must be for, for men right now to even think about what to do with there's no narrative to catch there, there's no narrative to hold it to, to hold up a different model of uh, uh of gender for them really i mean while we're, while we're happy to talk about equality we haven't really talked about what that means in terms of reimagining the family work structure yeah, and i think that's just as true for women as for men you know uh, we women still think of ourselves it's called you know the sociologists call it gatekeeping uh we we think of ourselves as the experts very often in things you know i my husband I've, I've studied this for years and i think it was only a couple of years ago that my husband walked in to the kitchen and caught me reloading the dishwasher <laughs> you know with the assumption of course that he didn't do it right and i know how to do it right and he pointed <laughs> out to me i think you call that gatekeeping and why should i ever load the dishwasher again if you're going to redo it <laughs> after i leave the room you know <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so we, we both have internalized them and i think that that we do imagine other scripts but that it is so hard to put them into practice in our existing society you know there's just so many so much pressure against it Yes, we have um, four children here and, and who are all teenagers now, and, and we've made it a practice in our household to identify misogyny and call it out. And I mean, it's got to be like every fifth sentence, I think, at this point. <laughs> I hope you're not going to drive them into crazy opposition. <laughs> I remember when my there, son. But we're doing our best. <laughs> I remember when my son was uh, looking. You know, he would look at something like, um, "Oh, those hor horrible um, videos," you know, with the women going showing their breasts and stuff. And I would comment from the background, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, at a certain point, I decided it was counterproductive to comment too much from the background. <laughs> He grew up to be a very non-sexist man, anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's so there's hope. Not everyone resists resists the feminist p parenting. <laughs> no, but sometimes you got to give them a break, you know. <laughs> For sure. Well, I want to say I want to say a bit about about this. This is this is actually an earlier book of yours, Mar Marriage: A History. No, well, actually, actually, it's not. It, it oh. the way we never were came out first, and then I did a revised introduction and um. Uh, so it's it, it's got a later date, but the bulk of it came out earlier. It was the first. Oh, okay, time. so this is the later book, Marriage. Yeah. yeah. Well, 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 I I really like this book. This this was really important because I think it, I mean dealing with many of the same of the same themes, but breaks down this sort of true love soulmate uh, narrative. Shows us how recent how recent that is that 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 marriage that that that, that marriage for love is 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 uh, is. I mean, you you tell us like, when when does that really start marriage for love? Well, in terms of a social practice in our European uh, history, um, you know, people had dreamed about it, uh, and there were love marriages. I I, I like to point people to Chaucer, um, the Chales of Chaucer, because he shows you such a wide variety of marriages. But even in there, there's a couple of really egalitarian, uh, loving marriages. Um, but the idea was, uh, the, the understanding in, was that marriage was too important a work relationship to, uh, to enter into it on the basis of such a, you know, frivolous and not necessarily rational <laughs> uh, uh, interpretation of your, your partner's qualities as, as love. Uh, so you always had that tension between, well, we'd like to, to be in love, but in fact, marriage is, is something much more important than that. And it really doesn't become uh, a, a big concern and actual pressure to marry for love until the 18th century. And in some ways, I used in this book, uh, I interpreted that as sort of uh, a reaction to the Enlightenment and the revolutionary period that the older generation of the state shouldn't dictate to the young. But as I'm looking at this material now, I'm also beginning to think that there's an element of pressure um, in terms of its impact on women, that the idea that romantic love 
is what explains the caregiving that we do and mm. the you know the 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 insulation of the woman's domestic sphere because we love them so much that we sacrifice for this and we think of them all the time and we try to make their lives easier again it's not a, a victim thing because it's not always great to to go out to work either you know right. there are there are advantages sometimes to staying home but in both of us there's been i think you make this very clear in in what you've written and in what you're trying to to tell your own kids that it just develops it over it's like if you only exercised one side of your arm uh it would be you know it'd be great to have oh you know you might do some good things with that arm but you're neglecting the other arm <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, a, a thing that was so so important about the, these uh, th this idea of, of of recognizing just how new the notion of, of marriage for love as a normal thing. Um, one of the things that was so powerful for me in in reading that, I mean, uh, on on the one hand, it sort of reframes so many so many classic uh, no novels that we have, where where you realize, oh, they're tragedies because love's not supposed to be in marriage, and the tragedy is that love got mixed up in <laughs> too too strong into the relationship. Um, um, but but more importantly to me, my my background is is in Jungian psychology, and I, there was so much that that I read over the years about fairy tales and mythology and this idea that marriage was the was a uh, was a, a union of masculine and feminine in a sort of you know great wholeness of, of and that we should understand it symbolically is that and I mean reading your work just sort of opened my mind and went wait a second that doesn't make any sense almost all these stories are written at a time when 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 marriage is 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 contractual when really these stories are much more about men obtaining a uterus than they are about any kind of uh about any kind of love or integration of of so-called feminine psychological traits is that is that fair well, uh, I mean, it's uh, I as a historian, I just love it when people say, yeah, you have to put things in their historical context. I, I think um, at the risk of sounding less feminist than you, <laughs> I, I, I really do think this works both directions, that this element of love is also a real manipulation of men, that you have to go out and do this because the wife is dependent on you. And, you know, one of the things I'm struck with when when I look, when I think about child rearing and children is how many good words we have until they become adults for girls who act like boys. But how many bad words we have for boys who don't act like adult men, you know, I mean, how many times, you know, I, you know, suck it up, act like a man, don't go, don't be a crybaby. You know, they, they don't say that to girls. Uh, so there's this this thing that works against both sides on it um, and these love stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a a a absolutely. And, and, and there's just the, and there and there's a degree to which the you know, I, I mean, I like that you're saying that because I, I don't know that it's that it's. I mean, you said you joke that it makes you uh, risk of being less feminist than me. But again, that, I mean, I think that's at the core of so much of what I'm getting at in in father figure is this question of the of how men uh, how fathers, how husbands um, are um, don't even want to participate in 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 patriarchal inequality, but don't have another way to imagine it, right? So they're so they're trapped, and and I won't even get into the the, the really negatives of of men being trapped in so called manliness, um, but because uh, there's lots of people writing about it, but yeah, but I, I think yeah, I think that's really important because one of the alternatives that you get is a historically constructed feminine notion of of love. You know, our, our Francesca Cancian has talked about that, that we women developed, when you go back to the 17th and 18th century, women in mixed sex groups talked just as frankly and brutally about sex and all of these things as, as men did. Um, and they did not have this a sense that they were sisters under the skin at all because there was such hierarchy. Mm. Um, so it's really only with the development of the love match and the new idea that men take care of women and protect women and women have to fall in love with this guy who is total stranger to them. 
you know, who, who, who could hurt them, who's more powerful, who's richer, who's stronger, who's, who's more powerful, who's dangerous. And because that's what makes him an effective, effective provider is that he can be dangerous. And yet we have to somehow uh, get this guy to love us because then he won't, you know, from, from um, Jane Eyre to Fifty Shades of Grey, that's all about being feminine enough to tame the guy who could hurt you. So he won't hurt you. So women then learned an idea of what was intimacy, first by talking among ourselves about what does what does this, as every move mean? How do we interpret it? What do you think he meant by that? And this total, you know, interrogation of the, you know, just absolutely, you know, probably trivial things. But what did it really mean about how he feels? Because I don't understand how he feels and I can't ask him directly. So we women sometimes have a very feminized, um, partial version of love. Well, he doesn't talk to me enough. Well, you know, washing somebody's car is a version of love too. And if we can't go back and forth, both of us, in terms of those kinds of love, and we impose on men the idea that you have to be like a like a 19th century woman <laughs> in, interrogating every meaning, you know, and talking all the time about feelings. Um, I personally couldn't stand it <laughs> myself. <laughs> Most men I know would, are going to go choose patriarchy over that in a hurry. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if that makes sense to you, but, <laughs> but <laughs> no, no, no. The no, lack no. of a the lack of a of a, a real well rounded alternative yeah. to traditional manhood is what I was trying to get at. <laughs> no, no, and I, I I think you said it you said it really really well. Um, I, I guess I I want to I want to move on because you, you you told me before we started this that you're you're working on uh, on an essay about about patriarchy and paternalism slash maternalism. Um, but but we're talking about fathers, so I'll stick with paternalism, not to exclude <laughs> the other the other side for now. But but um, I would just love to hear more about that. Um, uh, more about you know may, maybe the, maybe start by 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 defining the differences. Well, first of all, I, I don't think that there's such a thing as the patriarchy. That's like saying the class society. Right. Forms of inequality, male and other forms of inequality, vary tremendously through history. And yes, there have been, perva there have been pervasive um, male inequality, but there's also been pervasive class inequality. And so to, to me, to privilege that one as the central driving force of all societies, and then to imply that it all works in the same way, does not help us understand how we can change it, it seems to me. You know, it just becomes this, the patriarchs are doing that, and, and that that just leaves me cold. So- But can I'm, I play devil's advocate on that for one sure. second? I, my understanding of it is that patriarchy comes with the assumption, and I'm the only non-academic in the room, so I could be completely <laughs> mincing this, but patriarchy comes with the assumption that there is an inherent power structure that is first dictated by the ma being male, um, and from that, making additional assumptions about hierarchy that stem from innate levels of power. So is it really... Um, I, I, I I would argue, are, aren't they still connected to some extent or do you see them as totally distinct? Well, I, I do think that there is a pervasive uh, and recurring sense that that um, manhood should be valued more than uh, womanhood. But in practice, in hierarchical societies, that race and class all, always uh, you know outweigh that. You know, I mean, we... Right. To, today, it's women who defer, you know, by the 19th century, women have deferential ways of speaking and stuff. But, you know, in the 17th century, a man who was a lower class would lower his eyes, step off the road before a, a superior female or male. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's just important just to recognize yeah. that there are different variations and it takes place in different ways. Um, pay Patriarchy said to women, you have got to obey and we will punish you if you don't obey. But it didn't say to them, you're not capable or uh, of disobeying and you're not capable of being just as shrewd as a woman and as a man. And in fact, when it's appropriate, you should be. 
you look, go, you go back to Shakespeare's place. You know, you said you pointed out that a lot of the tragedies were because love <laughs> crept in where it shouldn't. But, you know, you've got Portia dressing up as a man and winning, uh, you know, the case that the man, the real man couldn't do. You so have this um, is this is fascinating. So the older form of patriarchy was we believe you have the same talents and skills, but because we are inherently more powerful, whatever that is, you will obey. Whereas women today and among men, there is this this narrative, this very strong narrative that it's that women are the weaker sex and less capable of dealing with, for example, money or whatever right. those other right. things are. Right. It's like really I've been reading patriarchal theorists and, and they will tell you, you must obey your husband, even if he's you have greater faculties of mind than he has. This is a this is an admission that disappears in the 19th century, you know, <laughs> that, that you might be smarter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's fascinating, and I think I hear you say saying maybe uh, maybe I'm not. Well, let me let me ask you, and you'll you'll tell me if I'm getting it right. I mean, I also hear you saying that 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 in the past we have lots of places where certainly um, men were in charge, um, but the but the but the 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 criteria for establishing that hierarchy wasn't based on gender it was based on maybe firstborn birthright for example and then even all the other men were also considered uh, subjugated oppressed exploited absolutely i think that that you get this theory of of manhood just as there's a theory of personhood that in this society tends to be white right. uh, there's a theory of personhood that says that it's male but really doesn't apply to all males, you know. And patriarchy, as a as the in its European sense, was ruled by older, propertied men over the younger ones, and second in command to them were pro older, propertied women. Mm -hmm. And they were certainly you 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 would you would have no again democracy improved our women's position in many many ways, you know. But today. Female supervisors tend to get harassed more uh, than just the co-workers uh, in many in many occupations. This would have been unthinkable in the 16th century. Your hand would probably have been cut off. <laughs> <It's progress>. <laughs> or something else. <laughs> So, 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 so tell, tell me how the paternalism fits into your into your new your new work. Well, I, I'm, these are this is a book of essays because um, I've never written a book that didn't take me at least five years to research. And so I was resisting. And then they said, well, essays work. And I've written a lot of op eds. And I thought, well, this could be like op eds only longer. And of course, I was a fool. Uh, <laughs> I'm taking just as long as this uh, as anything else. So this is only one of the, the essays that I'm writing. But uh, I want to spend some time showing that um, one of them, well, you will, okay, let me just give you a good example. When they look at studies of how women react to hostile sexism or patriarchal kind of versus benevolent sexism, you know, I'm doing to protect you. It dis the benevolent sexism disempowers them a lot more than the hostile. And so my argument is that despite the fact that the contradictory fact that we now have actually more opportunities to fight for real equality because of the development of democracy. Democracy also encouraged these racial and gendered theories of to excuse inequality that have made people internalize certain kinds of traits and that women have been internalized the sense that, well, we, you know, we, we do need to be protected or and it's pleasant to be protected. You know, um, it you know, it's nicer. If so. But what they do to to girls and I you, you've studied this, I'm sure, much more than I. But they you know, oh, you don't need to you know, you don't you don't you don't need to work. Teachers don't like make them work as hard to solve a problem as they do boys. And that feels good at first, but it's ultimately really disempowering. And that's what I mean by paternalism. And I would say that paternalism is is. Um, benevolent sexism and that that was what developed out of fraternity as opposed to patriarchy that as you got this idea that there's a brotherhood of man uh and you no longer have the hierarchies between men or at least then you have to explain why some men you know like black men or native american men and why all women 
don't have the same rights as the brotherhood has. Right. And that's when they do these, these um, naturalizing kinds of things that we all internalize. So just to just to bring this back, because I'm here to um, for those of us who are going to talk guys. about his book, I think. <laughs> yeah, I just have one one more question and then we can do that. <laughs> so can you just articulate um, as if I'm in, in eighth grade, the connection between patriarchy and paternalism that you're I'm still trying to wrap my head around what the thesis is in a way that I can understand it because okay. I'm still getting there. Um, okay, well, that's that's good for me because that's the point I meant trying to explain it in, in my book. Um, but I, th I guess what I'm trying to say is that under patriarchy, there was ev there was hierarchy everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, when they when when the first um, guy in the 16th century alphabetized a list of notables for the king, uh, not of notables, but of authors, he apologized deeply for using the alphabet to organize this. Because if you put somebody whose last name started with an A, but who was of lower status than of somebody who started with C, this was terrible. <laughs> said, but I had to do it because I didn't know what all these authors' ranks were. <laughs> and so therefore I might, if I did it, tried to do it by rank, I might have you know, said that you have higher rank than, than this guy. So for for in that kind of situation, um, male dominance was more theoretical for everybody other than the elite uh, than it is today. It was not an entitlement of being born with a particular body. Um, and so, so, so we shouldn't be saying smash the patriarchy. We should be saying smash the hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think smash the patriarchy is sort of like um, I was an activist in the movement against the war in Vietnam. And some of the people thought that the most radical slogan to raise against the war in Vietnam was to say smash imperialism. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, most people don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a slogan that most people know what it means and that is very radical. Support our boys in Vietnam. Bring them home now. Yeah. So. That's my attitude towards slogans like smash patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Most people don't get them and it doesn't get you very far. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> <laughs> now smash a particular patriarch. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, do you have any questions for us? Well, I mean, now, you were collaborating in, in terms of this. How has Amanda changed what you were initially planning to uh, say about feminist men? Oh, I mean, I don't know that I'd be able to have said nearly as much about feminist men if it, if it weren't for Amanda. I mean, I, th I think um, it gets to so much of what we've already said. Um, I, I, I think the uh, uh, our willingness as partners to interrogate so many familiar conventions and to and to ask questions about that and to be sort of and to be turned on by the by the by the constant uh, question of do you know why are we doing this are we doing this because of gender conventions are we doing this because we want to do it right are we picking our roles in the household because they're what we're each better at or are we doing it just based on what we think you're supposed to do because of some gender thing i mean uh, um that takes an enormous amount of commitment, discussion, um, and and both of us having a willingness together to not only um, challenge and ask the questions, which sounds like the easy fun part, but the the, the hard part gets to the the stuff like um, if the expectation that we've all been socialized to believe is that. Um, women are supposed to be better at cooking, right? <laughs> that's part of nest making. That's that part of, of caretaking. Then, then it also, you know, I, it, it becomes hard for um, for Amanda to give up some some of those things because because she thinks they're supposed to be what it means to be the the wife or the mother or the or the or the something else, and 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 vice versa, of course, for me, right? Um, um, it, it, all the things that I think I'm supposed to do because I witnessed my father or because I see it on television, and and how and just being the, the struggle to interrogate that is really a, a partnership 
um, um, challenge, and of course, it leads to many, um, many arguments. Um, and uh, and and I mean, I would say. But I'll give a happy example. <laughs> um, <clears throat> is uh, we were a second marriage relationship, and um, for the first ten years of our of our relationship before quarantine, we <laughs> lived separately. And there were many, many times where I would say, don't you just want to move in together, even though I love my independence? And there was many, many nights when I would leave his house and go home to mine and go, yes, I'm going to get to be alone for <laughs> two days or whatever that was. But he always said to me, he would often say to me, no, I really don't want that because I don't want to unconsciously recreate anything that would make you feel like my property, which I always found like really um, there he's always had a just a very strong commitment to maintaining our wholeness as people and not assuming anything about what my role is in his life as a result of our relationship, which I've deeply appreciated. And what you say just ties in uh, beautifully with the research on same-sex couples versus heterosexual couples, that same-sex couples don't necessarily divide the housework and the childcare more evenly than heterosexual couples do, but because they come to it with the same backgrounds, they have to negotiate who really wants to do or should do or is, is more convenient to do to do what. And for heterosexuals, uh, what you say is that, uh, you know, I think you're absolutely right, is if you don't have those hard conversations, you will just fall into the patterns. So and in the long run, it, it you know, they the research I've been seeing, I, I do a lot of work with the Council on Contemporary Families. Um, turning other people's research into like short briefing papers that we can put out. And um, I've worked a lot recently on the Dan Carlson and, and uh, Sharon Sassler and Amanda Miller have done these studies that show that contrary to just even 20 years ago, um, people who have these discussions and people who share childcare and um, uh, housework more, more evenly um, because, and, and, and more more attuned to their individual qualities, you know, have much better relationships now. But, you know, even 20 years ago, that was not true because it was so threatening to people, yeah. uh, to people's image of themselves as a woman or a man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I have to say, to, 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 to go into uh, Amanda's example of how we, we only decided to move in together during uh, the, during the pandemic, I mean, I, always in the back of my head was this idea is, wait, are you finally just sort of surrendering to the status quo because the whole rest of the world is full of so much uncertainty and confusion? Like you need, you're, so you're, you're just sort of doubling down on something that at least is familiar and feels stable at a time when nothing else does. <laughs> no, I just want to be with you 24 seven. And that's really the only motivation. <laughs> <laughs> you can maybe maybe sometimes analyze this a little too much <laughs> yes, for sure <laughs> are there any other things you want to ask us well what um you know what would you say to somebody who asked you i don't know i don't know what feminism is why would i want to be a feminist father <laughs> yes. Well, you know, uh, and a lot of people have asked me that lately. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I the, the, the definition I use in father figure of feminism, I took from bell hooks. And it's a it's a very simple definition, which is which is I'll paraphrase it because I don't remember it um, exactly. But it, it, it is basically a, a, a commitment to ending uh, subjugation, uh, exploitation or oppression based on based on sex. Um, and, and, and it's that simple. And the reason I like that definition is I don't think that it necessarily, you know, I, I don't think it implies what so much of the um, anti-feminist anti, anti propaganda implies, that it's a battle between men and women, that it's about women taking power from men. It doesn't imply any of that. It just implies very, very simply that, that we, don't, we believe everybody, and, and I extend it in father figure even further beyond just cisgender questions of uh, of um of equality to to transgender and gender nonconforming like everybody should have a life a life of dignity and and to me being a feminist dad means a willingness to interrogate my own actions to make sure that I am first and foremost not an obstacle to other people living a life of freedom and dignity but even more so am actively 
um, am actively promoting and modeling for my children and for anyone who sees me uh, a, a commitment to, to equality and dignity for all. And I will add that one, one of the, there's so many things I love about Jordan's feminism, especially when he challenges mine, which is often, <laughs> um, is that, uh, you know, he not only shares so much of the housework, he does the majority of it because he happens to be way better at it than <laughs> I am. Um, and it's hella, hella sexy to have a feminist dad, you know, <laughs> playing part that part in the household. So another good advantage to it is that you become very, very attractive to the other sex when you're supporting <laughs> the other sex and doing things in the house. <laughs> And and actually, the research backs you up to on that too. <laughs> Not just your own experience. <laughs> yeah, I had a um, I had a work dinner the other night, and um, I did I forgot to tell Jordan it was a spontaneous thing, and he cooked for all the kids. He cleaned up. I came downstairs from my late night work meeting, and I had dinner laid out for me and a glass of wine, and there was no like you stuck me with the kids and you didn't warn me and all the stuff that I had internalized that I was going to feel, I was just free to be in that. And we kind of throw that ball back and forth. And I wish this for everyone. It's really a glorious way to live. <laughs> well, it sounds like you are certainly a feminist husband. Um, being a feminist father must be difficult given the pressures that there are on boys, especially as they go into middle school and yes. you know are, are expected to lose the sort of things that made them uh, open and warm and loving to other people. So I hope you've got some advice in there for, for men who face that too. <laughs> yeah, I'm still, I will say you've said you, you, you hit, you hit the, hit the ball on the note. No, nail on the head. The nail on the head. Thank you. I couldn't think of things fresh. In the, <laughs> um, yes, because certainly it is, it is a struggle to, to watch Teenagers, uh, we have we have uh, we have three teenage boys in the house, and to watch them try to navigate um, while they all clearly have um, developed this uh, a feminist consciousness. On, on, on I lost you. Some level, um, and they've said it to us. It's really hard in school to 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 show it because it, it, there's a whole status game going on in, in in school where sometimes it's better to shut up. They tell us than to than to than to stand up for the the the, the marginalized. Uh, that that the, you lose social status by standing up for people, and that's um, yeah, it's a real hard thing to think about how to talk to talk kids through that and support them through that while also wanting them to be the people you want them to be. Yeah, uh, yeah, without forcing them to, you know, just go way beyond what they can handle at that age, you know? Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope people read your book. That's great. <laughs> I, 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 I do too. <laughs> <laughs>